October 3rd. It's uh, 8 p.m. UTC. I welcome you to session four, the panel on metadata for statistical data. I am Marie-Claude Côté from Library and Archives Canada, and I am your moderator for this panel. I'd like to recognize that I am speaking with you today from the traditional unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation in Canada. Before I introduce your speakers, uh, let me say a few words about the session logistics. Each presenter will speak for about 20 minutes, one after another. Uh, a question period will follow at the very end of the session for about 20 minutes. And uh, to this effect, please use the Q&A channel to ask your questions. You can also uh, post questions anonymously if you wish, or you can look at the questions already asked and uh, choose your favorite ones. You can also raise your hand uh, if you want to ask the questions. Uh, I mean, raise the virtual hand on Zoom if you want to ask the question yourself. Okay, for all the details concerning our speakers and their presentations, please visit the conference website at www.dubloncore.org. Okay, let me share my screen now. Okay, so this is our panel. Now, let's me, let me introduce our speakers in order of presentation. First, Daniel Gilman of the US Bureau of Labor Statistics will present us with an overview of statistical data. Right after, David Baraclough of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development we provide an overview of the SDMX standard and how the OECD is using it to improve accessibility and interoperability. And last but not least, Gabriel Gellner of Statistics Canada will share with us the Statistics Canada's approach in implementing its virtual metadata in integrated platform. So without further ado, please welcome Dan Gilman. Dan, over to you. Thank you. Let's see about getting the screen share here. Can you can you see my my slides? Yes. Okay. So, and is it is it a split screen? Because I can change it. Oh yes, it's a split screen. Okay. So um, that that switches that. Is that that's just a slide. Okay, good. So um, thank you very much, Marie Claude. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, give an overview of what is statistical metadata. So, so first, there's a little bit about statistical offices. There are many around the world. There are um, statistical offices associated with uh, each country some international like OECD that David is, is from, uh, many national banks and, and other organizations. Um, most countries have one uh, official statistical office that's responsible for most of, of the national indicators. <clears throat> but uh, the US is um, an exception. We have 13 principal federal statistical agencies my agency, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Census Bureau are the two biggest and probably the best known, um, but there are um, 11 others. And the responsibility for the national indicators is spread around these uh, offices. <clears throat> the work at statistical offices is remarkably the same across uh, countries and, and um, uh, kinds. So, we, we have much of the same business practices um, and we uh, collect data often through traditional uh, interview surveys that are based on um, a sample that uh, is selected th through probability. And we also collect data through censuses, which are uh, collections of um, every uh, 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 unit in, in some population. 
<clears throat> but there's also a lot of new work to uh, con uh, combine uh, the traditionally uh, collected data with uh, data from administrative programs and other government offices, data scraped from the web, and uh, other, uh, uh, other sources. Through sample survey uh, data, we produce estimates. We use the theory of probability and statistics. And so therefore the estimates that we have have a known reliability. This is called the sampling error. The media often refer to this as the margin of error. There are other uh, errors also uh, that come from uh, conducting a data collection called non-sampling errors. Examples are errors in the way uh, questions are designed, uh, errors that the interviewers um, uh, make, and uh, uh, errors that the uh, respondent, the person or uh, uh, entity uh, responding to the survey might make. So at a statistical office, the goal is to produce high quality, trustworthy, transparent, comparable, timely, and useful data. We, we do this in, in very much the same ways, and there's a, uh, a widely shared uh, high-level workflow. And this is uh, encoded in a standard called the Generic Statistical Business Process Model that the UN office uh, in Geneva, the Economic Commission for Europe, uh, oversaw. There are eight main phases in the uh, GSBPM, and I've listed them here. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Those, the standard is presented in this uh, tabular form. Each of the uh, main phases is in uh, blue, the, the columns, and there are what are called sub-processes under each one. This doesn't specify the order in which these are done. It just specifies what's done in a, in a, um, in a typical example, but very often the, um, uh, the order is not in the, uh, the, the order in which these are actually conducted is not in the uh, same as the way they're presented. So this leads us more to uh, statistical metadata and the uh, definition is essentially that statistical metadata is data used to describe statistical data, processes, and other artifacts. And these are the, uh, the inputs and outputs of the activities or processes in the GSPPM. So let's look at what this means in practice and, and maybe look at it in a little bit more detail. So here's a, a number, 3.7%. I don't know how many of you might know what I'm referring to here uh, because I work for the Bureau of Labor Statistics. This is the US unemployment rate for August in 2022, but you couldn't know that unless you have this additional information. But this begs questions itself. And what, what does it mean to talk about the unemployment rate? How often is it collected and so forth? So how is unemployment defined? How are the data collected, especially uh, through uh, probability sample survey? And what limitations do these uh, methods impose? So these are questions that statistical metadata is uh, designed to try to answer. <clears throat> so, Let's look at unemployment a little bit. So for us, unemployment doesn't just mean not employed because do we really want to count uh, as unemployed all the people that are retired or unable to work, say for disability, stay-at-home parents, prisoners, students, including children, or people laid off and have given up uh, finding new work? So. Not working is the same is not the same thing as unemployed. So for us, unemployment means that you're not working, but you're available to work, 
and that you've been looking for work uh, in, the, in the last four weeks. We use this to uh, help uh, build up what we call the labor force. So the employed people in the labor force, they, these are the people that are currently working, but we don't count the military. Um, there's just the civilians that are, that are working. So the labor force then is the number of employed and the number of unemployed as we strictly defined unemployed. So then therefore the unemployment rate is simply the uh, number of unemployed divided by the labor force and then you multiply by 100 and you get a nice percentage rather than a decimal. So it's just a ratio and uh, it it's simply means that. But how do we produce the, the unemployment rate? So the, we use a survey called the Current Population Survey. This is our lab, the labor force survey in the United States. It's the source of the data for the unemployment rate. We conduct it every month because we, uh, we issue an unemployment rate every month. Um, it's based on a sample of about 60,000 households in the US. It's a probability-based sample. The sample's actually selected in stages, and that's interesting, but we don't really have the time to get into that. Each selected household is interviewed for four consecutive months, then is not interviewed for the next eight, and then interviewed again for the next four consecutive, and then um, is out of the sample. <coughs> the, the survey is sponsored by, uh, by BLS, but the Census Bureau collects the data and uses a complex questionnaire to uh, interview the people in each of the households. And from that data, because it's collected monthly, we issue a uh, what's called the monthly employment situation. We do this every month. And we do that typically on the first Friday of, uh, of the month. So in looking at CPS in, in a little bit more detail, so there's a, a, it's based on the use of a probability sample. And what this means is that the data, the estimates that we build have a, have a built-in reliability from the sampling error. And then of course, the other errors are called non-sampling errors. And we try to reduce these as much as we possibly can. <clears throat> After the data are, collected and, and uh, come uh, into actually at first at the, at the Census Bureau, they fix the values that seem wrong or, or inconsistent. And this is called editing. And then after that, there are efforts to adjust for missing data. Uh, many people don't wanna to respond to surveys um, in the US. And I think this is a problem around the world. And we try to then adjust for missing data and through a process called imputation and other statistical methods that, that we apply. And then after the fact, after the data are disseminated, after the estimates are produced, we do an evaluation and we look for anomalies. And in fact, at the beginning of COVID, when the unemployment rate uh, in April, 2020 was uh, produced, People were expecting the rate to be uh, above 20%. And it turned out to be, I believe, 14.7%. So it was much lower. What happened was they found that there was an error in the way that, or in inconsistency in the way that the interviewers were asking a particular question. If that had been consistent, then uh, we uh, estimate that the unemployment rate might have been at high as 18 or 19 percent. So the, this is a link to the employment situation. It comes out every month. And the next release is this coming Friday at 8.30 a.m. U.S. Eastern time. And that is precise. And we do it that way so that people can't use the, the number to place bets against stock, stock markets and things like that. 
So back to statistical metadata then. So what we've gone through so far shows that there's a lot of different things that we need to care about. The one, definitions. We want, we need to know what unemployment really means to be able to talk about what the unemployment rate means. We have what's called a population. These are the people that we count in the survey. It's called the civilian non-institutional population. So we exclude prisoners, we exclude the military and so forth. The sample, as I mentioned before, is um, designed in stages. And then the sample is used to create weights, which is, so when you uh, uh, collect survey data, the sample is a small fraction of the total population. In order to get population estimates, you multiply the responses in the survey by some number, which is the weight, which is how much that particular response uh, contributes to the total. We also need to know about the questionnaire because just asking questions affects the quality of the data that you get. The question wording, the response choices that are available, what the next question is, which is sometimes based on the, uh, the particular response. So one response uh, uh, leads you one way through the questionnaire, a different response leads you somewhere else. All of these have an impact on the way, on the, on the quality of the, of the underlying data. Of course, we need to be able to describe the variables that are in the data sets. We have to know what they mean. We have to know what the allowed values of the variable are. We want to know the data type, unit of measure if it's a, um, a, a, a quantitative measure, the universe, which is the um, uh, people that, uh, in this case, that were asked the questions, and, and the format in a data set, which of course leads us to the data structure. How are the data organized within a file? Then we also care about the processing details because we want to know how the data were edited. If there's an imputation that's applied, we want to know what happened, because if we're going to be using the data that are generated statistically, we need to know some details about that. <clears throat> so then we finally get to the uh, to the estimates uh, in for CPS, the unemployment rate. We have to use weights to derive the estimates. We need to know the derivation formula, which I showed you before, which is fairly simple in this case. And we need to know a lot about the reliability, how, how accurate based on this sample is the number that we're um, disseminating. So that's a quick overview of statistical metadata. It's complex. And there are a number of standards that have been developed uh, to help statistical agencies organize all this information. So the first is a series of standards known as the Data Documentation Initiative, or DDI. And DDI is not a single standard, but it's a uh, uh, actually a collection of them. And there, there are five important ones that I want to mention. Um, there's a simple uh, uh, standard for describing um, uh, an, an individual survey and its data called Copebook. There's a more complex uh, standard called Lifecycle, which uh, allows you to describe the entire statistical lifecycle from design to dissemination. So it's used a lot in statistical agencies. There's a new standard that's just about to be released called cross-domain integration for the capability of uh, combining data from multiple sources. Um, there's something called the Extended Knowledge Organization System, or XCOS, which is actually an extension of SCOS um, that uh, incorporates some of the needs for, um, uh, for handling statistical classifications. There are some particulars of statistical classifications that SCOS didn't address. 
And then there's this uh, standard, uh, sorry, the Statistical Data Transformation Language, or SDTL, which is used to uh, document uh, the uh, process. There's the Statistical Data and Metadata Exchange, which David is going to uh, speak about next, so I won't say much about that. Um, I also mentioned the uh, generic statistical business process model um, and the UNECE, which is um, uh, oversees a number of cooperative programs uh, for the countries uh, around the world, especially the ones in the Economic Commission for Europe. And there are four standards that have been developed uh, under the UNECE. There's the GSBPM. The generic statistical information model is really a model about statistical metadata uh, and it works in conjunction with the GSBPM. The, uh, the metadata in GSIM or the inputs and outputs for the processes described in GSBPM. There's also a statistical production architecture and a statistical data architecture. So as you can see, there are a number of different standards out there. Um, they, uh, some of them address uh, pretty much the same thing as others, but um, many of them are, un are fairly unique in their own way. And they, uh, there isn't a standard that addresses all of statistics. So that's what I needed to say. Um, are there any questions or maybe we take questions later? Yes, we will take all the questions uh, at the end. So if you have questions for them, uh, don't hesitate to send them um, uh, right away uh, using the Q&A channel of Zoom. Okay, thank you very much, so, Dan, uh, your presentation. Do I have to stop sharing? Yes, yes, you have. Yeah. Stop sharing. There we go. Yes. And uh, I'd like to tell you, Dan, that I feel uh, already more uh, smart, more, more competent or smarter to listen to our two next presentations. <laughs> Thank you very much. And talking about the next presentation, uh, the next one is an overview of the SDMX uh, standard and how the OCD is using it to improve accessibility and interoperability. So over to you, David. Okay, thank you very much, Claude. Can you see my screen okay? Okay. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, I've got these panels like stuck up everywhere. So let me just, uh, okay. So yeah, I, I'm going to uh, describe, well, I, I'm going to give an overview of the SDMX standard and uh, describe the, the, the main OECD use case at the moment, which is uh, uh, migrating uh, all of our uh, public uh, metadata and data uh, to SDMX uh, to improve its accessibility and, and usability. So uh, I wish I could hide this bottom panel, but I can't, so I'll just have to keep going. Okay, uh, so first of all, what is SDMX? For, for those of you who don't know, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, some of you do, but it stands for Statistical Data and Metadata Exchange. Um, it first came out in 2002 as an initiative to, uh, to foster standards for a statistical information exchange. This is what it was initially uh, designed for. Um, there were seven sponsor organizations at the time, and it's the same seven sponsor organizations now. They're on the screen. I'm not going to read them out. Um, and it, came, it, it became an ISO uh, standard in, uh, I, can't, I can't see, I wish I could, uh, I don't know how I can hide this bottom panel. Um, David, we don't see the screen bottom. Machine. Yeah, I, I can though. It's it's the Zoom, it's a Zoom uh, panel, but I can't see how to. Anyway, okay. Well, uh, yeah, it's now it's become an ISO standard, and I can't see the the year that it became. Anyway, I'll carry on. It just means I can't see the bottom of my slides. Oh, okay. So, but we see it. Uh, that's perfect for us. 
Okay. Uh, okay, so what, what's inside STMX? Um, well, so it's a set of standards, uh, I guess, as, as Dan said, you know, about uh, you know, DDI as well. Um, a part of the standards is uh, uh, guidelines for uh, how to code statistical data sets. Um, uh, many uh, best practices and, and recommendations for uh, implementing exchange, but also for modeling data, um, several other things. And there's technical implementation notes as well. Um, there's also uh, very important, of course, that the actual technical standards themselves. Um, so there are standards to uh, describe SDMX web service web services uh, that say uh, what what is an SDMX web service. It defines the interfaces uh, and other things. Um, there's a metadata registry standard. So this is uh, you know it defines uh, how um, SDMX artifacts are stored and, and queried and, and and several other things as well. And at the heart of SDMX is a information model. Uh, designed for exchange and uh, everything else is is based uh, around the information model and relates to it um th there are many uh, reusable tools uh, available for stmx uh, you know, most of which are, are free and many are open source these are all available uh, by going to stmx.org and, and looking at the tools page um and yeah, just from the start, uh, SDMX was designed for, for aggregated data in hypercubes. Um, there's a new version, SDMX3, which go, goes beyond that. Um, but, but anyway, SDMX was making a lot of inroads into improving you know, how to structure, uh, structure data, uh, not just on how to improve the exchange of information between agencies. Oops. So. Okay, yeah. Uh, so what is what is SDMX not? Because there's sometimes uh, quite a bit of confusion. It's not just a technical format. It, it's not. It's not a, just a, 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 an alternative to PDFs and, and Excel questionnaires. Um, uh, it's certainly not tied to a single tool. There, there are many, and anyone can create a, a, another tool. Um, it's not for, it's not for profit. It came from the official statistics uh, community. Um, uh, both uh, uh, official stats agencies and the private sector participate in the working groups that uh, that define the standard, and uh, private sector and uh, and anyone else can freely uh, freely adopt it. So looking at some of the the, the main benefits, um, well. Uh, SDMX is, is designed uh, to save money and resources. This is probably like the main reason why it came, came, came about as an initiative to save money um, to, you know, with this idea of reusing systems and tools uh, and also uh, metadata and methodology, rather than having to create all of that for, for each domain or for each agency. Um, it can also avoid uh, uh, validation and fixing uh, round trips because validation is part of the standard and uh, most tools are free and open source. So, you know, the hope is to avoid having to develop something to do something in SDMX. Um, it is meant to improve quality. So a lot of the control vocabularies are, are based around standard classifications which of course a lot of work has already been been uh, been done there. Um, so we have control vocabularies, you know, that take ISO classifications, uh, things like that. Um, the automated process in which which it uh, enables helps reduce manual intervention errors, so therefore improving quality. And as I said, uh, valid validation as a part of the standard. And it also improves timeliness because automation means you know you can take out the uh, uh, the, the manual uh, delays when you can set up these processing uh, chains, um, and yeah, reduces delays from manual interventions such as copy and pasting into Excel questionnaires and things like that. Um, 
So the content-oriented guidelines, these are the best practices and, and, uh, and, and methods. Uh, these are looked after by the SDMX Statistical Working Group, uh, of, of which I'm, I'm the chair. Uh, Dan was the one of the chairs before me. Um, so uh, uh, the working group works on a lot of uh, you know best practices in um, you know governance of metadata. You know how to uh, create new uh, new models and new code lists. We we aim to like uh, align uh, a lot of metadata between domains. Um, Streamlining SDMX projects, make, you know, get getting them uh, up and running uh, quicker uh, off the ground. Um, we uh, try to offer as many control vocabularies as we can. So we have the SDMX glossary, uh, which uh, of course describes a lot of terms in SDMX, but it's not just a glossary like that because it codifies uh, uh, all of the terms. Uh, which means that uh, there are many uh, variables in there which uh, which can be used in machine to machine exchange um, and, uh, and and there's also many code lists as well these cross domain code lists uh, that we uh, that we maintain um, and there's many other recommendations like confidentiality and embargo uh, project modeling project management etc and there, there's a link on the page so um, yeah, this is just a, a quick slide on a, on a generic SDMX uh, like modeling uh, design project where you say, okay, now I want to uh, create a data model um, in SDMX because you know my tool supports SDMX, and uh, so this is what I want to do. I want to describe some data sets. So um, first of all, um, uh, this is a tried and tested method. First of all, you list all the data flows or the, 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 the means to present the data or exchange the, the, the data um, without thinking so much about the data model. You just think, well, what do I want to do with the data? Um, and then when you've done that, you list all of the kind of statistical concepts or the variables for all of the, the data flows. And then you look at the, these concepts and you, you, you start to author the code lists uh, for them, um, then you group these these concepts into data structure definitions with the actual, which are the actual cubes and where the data is stored. You go to this pilot testing uh, mode, and that's where you iterate over the the design project. And when when everything is done and agreed, then you move to implementation. Um, and this has been more fully described in a checklist for uh, design projects, which is kind of modeled around the, the GSBPM uh, kind of uh, presentation. So, and you, you can you can find it at this this link at the at the bottom. I'm certainly not going to start to describe that, but uh, you, you know, if you click on each of these boxes, then the step is fully described. So, uh, please use that if you're interested. Some common SDMX tools, um, uh, there, there are several for structural uh, modeling, you know, uh, designing uh, SDMX data sets, like, uh, well, well the, these that are listed, I'm not going to, to read them out. Um, and there's complete SDMX platforms as well, uh, like this first one that I'm going to show in the context of the OECD use case. But there's also the ISTAT SDMX toolkit. Uh, Fusion 10, um, there, there may be some others, I don't know, but uh, these, you know, offer like a data, data warehouse solutions and, and many tools around them. So uh, please look at sdmx.org tools page for others. So now we come to the use cases. Uh, first of all, there's three just like generic use cases that I'll describe it in a kind of like cookbook uh, style Um but I'm not going to spend much time on them. So if you want to report national accounts to international organizations, generally what you'll need is the, the global data structure definition for national accounts. Uh, you can Google this and you can find it. And then you map your database to this structure definition, and then you implement a tool, okay, to do the reporting. Um, and 
and blah, blah. so that's what you need and, and here's how to do it um you, you know if you uh, you, can, you can fill in an excel questionnaire and then convert to stmx or you can uh you know implement these other tools uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into this. I probably haven't got time. So, but please, you know, look at the slides after the presentation uh, if you're interested in, in you know, how to do this. So, if you wish to collect statistics from another agency, you know, again, uh, what you need in general is an agreement between the exchange partners on how to do it. Uh, you map the reporting form or the data structure and definition to your uh, to your database. And then you need a tool to uh, import uh, the SDMX into your database. So, yeah, again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to kind of uh, really go into these because I don't think I've got time. I should get to the OCD use case. And uh, another one for disseminating st statistics in general. You know, you need a data warehouse containing the statistics, of course, uh, a tool or platform that can generate the SDMX from your data warehouse. And a dissemination endpoint, uh, you know, like a web service. Okay, and then you can have a look at uh, how to do it in the slides. So, if we go to the OECD use case, which is the uh, the data migration project, and uh, I, I guess I know quite a bit about this because it's my team that are coordinating it. So, the the whole idea is to improve the dissemination and and, and management of the uh, OECD public uh, data sets. So it's not just a kind of accessibility and usability thing. It's also on uh, about how to make the maintenance of these structures uh, easier in the long run. So yeah, we aim to improve the OECD's uh, structural metadata uh, wholesale, basically, because our current uh, system um, we have uh, like several hundred uh, uh, like uh, data sets exposed, but they're all separate. You know, there, there's no, I mean, they, they may look as though they relate to each other sometimes, but they're all separate cubes. Um, so we want to, you know, have some way of like storing data together, but then exposing it in, in like different tables. We also, want to make the, the coding of the terms much, much more consistent, much more consistent, uh, and have a high reuse of uh, structural metadata, and of course, increase the accessibility, because in doing this like uh, uh, restructuring of the metadata, it, it, we want it to drive the, the search, the filtering, pivoting, the discoverability, and, 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 and the basic visualization of the, the data. Um, uh, so how to do this? Well, we, we, we take the estimates best practices, which are already in the content oriented guidelines that I mentioned, uh, and we build on them. Okay. So um, we, we've kind of gone to town on the unit of measure and, um, and, and, and we try to build a method on unit of measure, which is based on uh, you know, deriving units of measure based on scientific principles, and and also uh, the w when when a unit of measure is described, it's actually a unit of measure <laughs> rather than something else. Because we we saw a lot of that in the current system that you know it, it wasn't quite that. Um, and we've also uh, created metadata governance guidelines uh, internally. Uh, we we hope you know, to pass this to the community as well, but uh, they're still undergoing review. We've also um, uh, created the, uh, this thing called the DotStat Academy, which is a, a, an online uh, training program and a platform. Uh, here you can see the link that, uh, you know, can provide data managers and, and, and other roles with uh, these online training courses and certification. Okay, so if you go to the link now, uh, you have to create a registration, it's free, but you can find some courses there now. And there, there was a recent one that, that, that I did, uh, which is an introduction to STMX for data producers. So um, on the metadata governance, uh, I mean, I'm not gonna go into detail on this diagram, but basically, uh, we've tried to establish a, a strong internal governance 
on structural metadata. Okay, so um, first of all, we have an advisory team, which is my team, on uh, and we create the methodology for um, for, for creating the structural metadata and maintaining it, etc. Um, but there's also a community of practice which all of the data managers can can join, and, and certainly many of them have. It's very very well attended, um, and this acts as a review board for the shared structural metadata, okay? So when there's some shared structural metadata, such as like a, a code list on uh, economic activity, we form a working group of whoever wants to work in that, uh, uh, you know, participate in that working group uh, to come up with a proposal on such a code list. And when they're done, then uh, this, gets passed to the community of practice for review and you know commenting and um, and hopefully uh, approval at the end of the day and uh, yeah and structural metadata users they can participate in the cop and uh, there's all these kind of like links around but 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 this works very very well I mean of course you have to have some resources to put this in place but um, uh, personally, I think as a, as a generic kind of governance structure for shared structural metadata, it's been quite a success at the OECD. Um, and this is kind of dig digging uh, deeper into that. Again, I haven't got time, but basically, if I, if I just go back one. So in this structural metadata working group, there's a business process in how that works. And this is this is all mapped here. Okay, so when they work on when a working group works on a revision or a new uh, artifact, you know, we, we go through this process, and voila, and then out, out pops the structural metadata and gets passed to the community of practice. So, but this this works very well as well in a generic sense. It's uh, been a yeah, big success. So anyway, I'm, I'm coming to the end of the obviously the use case. So. Um, uh, of course, we, we need a system that, uh, to implement all of this, and this is the syscc.stat suite, um, which is a completely SDMX native uh, system. Um, we, we, like, the OCD started developing this system, but now a, a, there's a whole community around it of other agencies as well. There's about uh, 15 agencies who uh, have either implemented or, or are who are implementing .stat suite. Um, and there's, yeah, so .stat, .stat suite is like a data warehouse, but it's also an explorer, a lifecycle manager, and there's several other uh, tools around it as well. But the community gives you, you know, participates in best practices and things. So uh, you, you can Google for that, it's, and, and, and it's an open source system. So, um, uh, you know, you can actually download the system and, and use it uh, for free, but most agencies, they, they uh, participate in the community um, like uh, costs, you know, it's certainly non-profit, but, uh, you know, they participate to the community. Um, so uh, there's some other users for SDMX, you know, simplifying and documenting data flows, uh, just improving the organization of uh, statistical metadata and governance and uh, reference metadata. I haven't said anything about, but it's uh, we're using it in, in the OECD use case, and it can be used to uh, structure uh, as well reference metadata. Um, you know, avoid silo systems. You know, this is a big part of of saving money and uh, and speeding up the um, you know the implementation. Um, yeah, global DSDs, these are for, for several domains. Uh, we've uh, uh, created standard reporting forms in SDMX and, and they're implemented. So yeah, I'm not going to read them out because I think I'm running out of time. Um, but that's that's where they are. Um, SDMX version three, um, just very quickly, uh, this has just been released last year. Uh, we aim to provide a better way of modeling like survey and register type data, uh, multiple measures and attributes on measures and some other things in the standard enable that. Geospatial data modeling, uh, it provides easy management of metadata, um, et cetera. Okay, but uh, please uh, have a look at that if you're interested. So in conclusion, yeah, SDMX is a set of uh, standards really 
for improving exchange and, and modeling and, and probably other things now you know that i that i i covered like governance and things um and the goals are to uh well they're, they're here i think i've said enough about them so um and many many open source tools and guidelines uh, can and and should be be reused uh uh, you know to to implement uh, SDMX and uh, please uh, you know if you if you create a tool or a guideline <clears throat> please feel free to to share them as well so the the whole community can uh, can benefit thanks a lot thank you very much david um uh, for the, the overview of the SDMX set of standards and the, the use case at the OECD you succeeded to combine two of my pa patient passions in one uh, presentation, metadata and project management. So <laughs> I was really happy to, to see all the, the project management aspect to it uh, uh, as well. Thank you, uh, thank you, thank you, the, David. And now uh, let's welcome Gabriel Gellner of Statistics Canada. And Gabriel will uh, share with us the StatScan's approach and implementing its virtual metadata integrated platform. So, Gabriel, it's your turn. Perfect. So, again, I do the quick asking um, Do people see my screen and is it not the presenter view? Perfect. Okay, great. Well, and again, thank you so much for having me in this, uh, you know, a, a beautiful set up, I, I believe, I mean, really building on, on the two excellent presentations that we've seen. So um, I'm going to be speaking, uh, really focusing into just the sort of case study of how um, Statistics Canada is trying to, you know, build their vision of sort of a metadata portal, uh, building on top of standards like SDMX and DDI. Um, I'm a data scientist uh, working with a small other team of data scientists within uh, the organization. And so we are really focusing on uh, experimentation on some of the architectural and workflow visions that are coming from uh, different agencies and metadata experts. Um, we're trying to build a sort of rapid pr uh, prototyping platform so that as you know, we're investing more and more in SDMX repositories, DDI repositories, all of these metadata management systems, how we can begin to integrate them and sort of um, give our users both internal and externally a sort of more uh, global view of all of the data products that uh, Statistics Canada has. Um, it's largely built as uh, I'll show on sort of the idea of many different services uh, working together and how we do that integration. And I wanna sort of just state that everything I'm showing is very much a work in progress. Um, this part of the experiment is only uh, not even quite a year old. Um, and, you know, but it's building on all of this much more detailed work that we've been hearing about. Um, so one of the things I'm talking about is this idea of a metadata hub and this vision, and this comes from um, other groups within our organization that are really, you know, trying to build workflow management systems and talk about, you know, fair uh, data and all of the policies that, uh, you know, we're mandated to be part of. Uh, it includes many different groups within the organization that, you know, are, deal are building sort of analytic data platforms that are going out to, you know, internal researchers, as well as all of this kind of metadata management that we're talking about in dissemination. Um, I'm going to be speaking a lot about, like I said, our experiments that are looking at the end case of how we can start building our next generation search and discovery platform on top of all of these standards and interoperability uh, platforms. And we have many uh, different sub agencies uh, that are hoping to use this platform and are giving us feedback and, and data that we're testing all of these ideas out on. So here's a big diagram of our, you know, when I talk about the metadata hub, what it is. And so, you know, we have this sort of outside that's going to be an API driven gateway where, you know, both internal and external users will get access to our platforms that uh, are beginning to come online uh, at Statistics Canada. We're using um, some commercial platforms like Collectica, which is what we're using to manage our DDI repository. So all our micro data, survey level data. Um, 
We're using the .stat platform that was mentioned before for our aggregate statistics, and we're increasingly bringing that online. Um, we have another commercial product that's uh, for all our statistical classifications, uh, ARIA, which is housing all of these definitions, taxonomies, and classifications. And then we're using an open source data management platform for our, some of our geospatial uh, data, and that's in this geo network. And then finally, um, you know, CCAN, which is a large open source sort of data, open data portal platform that's used extensively around the world. Um, we're beginning to experiment with as a way to capture, you know, what we lovingly call as the misfits, um, you know, data sets that we have at the agency that aren't potentially easily able to be transformed into one of these standard formats that we're talking about, or you know, just uh, it's not practical to, but we're trying to then say that, you know, we'll have sort of mandated repositories that will be the source of truth for these different types of metadata that they are at the agency. Um, and then the team I'm working with, we've been building a sort of pipeline that is then mapping all of these different formats into sort of a, a kind of global format, which is the uh, stat DCAT format inside of a triple store. Um, that's kind of the key insight of the whole group that we're doing is having this view that has this kind of graph storage inside of the triple store formats that gives kind of a rich interface and querying capabilities that comes from this uh, Sparkle technology. And then the specific use case we're using that for then is to build another pipeline at this side, which is uh, doing automated creation of our indices across all of the different uh, Statistical Canada products so that users don't have to understand, you know, where each of these pieces are stored for the search and discovery phase of this. And then on top of that, we're building a simple sort of UI. Um, I just wanted to bring this up. This is from uh, European Union's kind of group that is building the STAT DCAT. So like many of the formats we've been talking about, kind of you know, talking about another related format. So we have the whole RDF um, family of kind of metadata standards. And so uh, DCAT is a very old one that's for data catalogs. Um, and then STAT DCAT um, is an extension that is being used by different agencies in the European Union's group. But the key piece is that Stat DCAT is trying to add in some of the SDMX um, format, so it's compatible, so it can integrate with SDMX and, and kind of have some of the same expressiveness, and so that that will ultimately lead to this idea of a sort of semantic interoperability, so that, you know, for groups like ours that are trying to, you know, deal with the fact that we have many different sources of truth and repositories in these standardized formats, how do we build integrative tools across all of them? And so that's kind of what we're uh, experimenting with, with the stat DCAT format. Um, just to give a slightly simplified way of how I think of this is that we're working in, in layers. So there's many groups um, that are doing the kinds of policies we've been hearing about to get all of our data kind of corralled into these repositories about DDI, SDMX, ARIA, and then we also, of course, always have legacy systems that are going to be passing around Excel files and maybe formats that data scientists are building. Um, we're working a lot on this processing layer. Um, we're largely using sort of Python when we need to do custom tools, but otherwise we're really um, building on top of this RML uh, ecosystem, which is a set of technologies that are basically to help the, the mapping between, you know, databases, uh, Excel files, or API endpoints, and then giving a sort of expressive language to then bring that over into RDF. Um, and then once we're in the sort of RDF phase, then we have all of these different levers we can uh, play around with, as domain experts might give us ontologies to start letting us do some of the pieces we're talking about to making sure that you know, we have coherent models and that we can do test and validation at that level, that we can query it, and that we can build sort of custom front ends and search indices like I'll be talking about. 
been talking about RDF a lot, and uh, I think just like there was a little discussion at the beginning of this, it's you know there's there's many domain experts who I'm sure know more about RDF than I do, but there might be some that this is uh, sort of new to. I know within our agency we have that um, that balancing act of people you know whose names are on some of these specs at the standards bodies down to you know IT professionals and data scientists who've never used the format at all. But the key for us is it's a graph format. Um, so basically it's lowest level of, of data representation. And I'm thinking about metadata in this context is in this, these kind of triples. And that's often uh, the data stores that we'll do instead of a database, you'll have, they'll call them a triple store, but it's functionally a sort of database for this RDF uh, format. And one of the reasons that we liked this piece of being used from an operational standpoint is that it, when we're being used as sort of this so semantic interoperability layer, it's very easy to sort of add tags to a graph and to uh, you know extend it out uh, when you have lots of information, but also be able to rapidly prototype by having much smaller pieces. So we liked the idea of going down this kind of you know what some people from Google branding are calling kind of a knowledge platform or a kind of graph database as being the sort of central hub that we can then build um, this kind of unified portal across our data products. Um, so again, like I've said, to do that, um, we spend a lot of time writing these RML definitions again with a domain experts. So people who know about the SDMX format, how it's structured, making sure that then when we're moving this into an RDF representation that we're capturing just like things that we heard about that our code sets are consistent that if those are um, you know, pointing at a classification system, that we're making sure we're not losing that information or flattening things that shouldn't be there, that we can do checks that against input validation to make sure that if they are pointing at a code set, you know, some it's not just a string in a, a you know, Excel file that somehow lost that. Um, so a lot of our group as we've built this pipeline that you can register with any endpoint or data file that you have a mapping file, and then it'll go through a sort of workflow, ultimately ending up in our sort of triple store representation or our knowledge platform. Um, this is the more detailed uh, process of kind of what we've been coding to. So the idea is that, you know, there's the domain level where we're working really closely with, with metadata experts who know these formats, you know, can help us kind of make sure that when we're doing this transformation, um, we're not missing details or, or making mistakes there. We build, we, we encode all of that into a machine operable format in these uh, mapping files. And then we'll transform them into the triple representation where we can then load those into memory and use uh, Shackle, which is one of the sort of uh, RDF technologies for that you can use for doing uh, some types of validation. So we check for, you know, required fields. We make sure that code sets that need lookups are being mapped correctly. They're using the same, you know, value and label fields. We have to do some checks on alignment of language between French and English, which we must support. Um, and we also check for whether some of the fields are empty. So, you know, some of our earlier versions of this, one of the lessons learned when we were just doing it with Python, and we didn't have quite as expressive of a way of checking these was, you know, we would just check whether a field was present, but not whether, you know, its representation made sense. So it wasn't just an empty string or uh, misspelled and so on. So now that we have some of those prototypes, we can even help with some of the data cleaning that's going on in the repository. So as we start loading this into the triple store in hopes that we'll be building products on top of that, we can also check and then report this back to um, the teams that are actually, you know, the sources of truth in these standardized repositories. Once it's gone through these checks and we load it into our triple store, you know, there's just a final check for some errors and then we're good to go. This whole process, by the way, is we're not trying to build a sort of another source of truth. The tr this will be rerun and recreated regularly where we'll delete it and build it. So we're also trying to engineer this so that it can be fast 
enough <laughs> that it can run in a batch process in this way so that we're not we don't want to create desynchronization between the SDMX, DDI, and so on, those those metadata sources of truth, and this kind of uh, coherent view of all of them together. Um, just in detail, I've been talking about these mapping files. So often uh, how we're doing is we'll send out uh, questionnaires and pieces to the metadata experts. They'll give us back often Excel files showing how the fields would map uh, between the different pieces. And then we would encode these into these RML files that build our triples for us. And again, this can all be, now we have it so that this is an API that can be registered so that it's extensible. Um, once we have all that, so now, you know, our, our kind of test case right now has about 6 million triples in it, which is, I would say, kind of a small <laughs> triple store. Um, and it's covering uh, a selection of our metadata repository, so DDI transformation, some of our SDMX um, dot stat um, endpoints, as well as um, some Excel files and uh, geospatial data. So we're trying to have a good sampling of the different things that we have, bringing it all into this triple store so that then we can build the back half of the pipeline, which writes uh, generic Sparkle queries, which again, we register with our system, which then creates a, um, an Elasticsearch index for each of the different repositories. You know, similar workflow, a little simpler because at this point, you know, we've done a lot of the validation um, of the metadata before going into the triple store. At this point, it's largely just registering um, our Sparkle query, which we then map to the sort of input format that Elasticsearch needs. And then we load that uh, and then we can check if there's any errors or, or missing fields if it gets to this point. So just to say, here's a quick little screenshot of, again, this kind of rapid prototyping piece that we're using. So every piece of this is built on APIs. We're trying to use all open source tools that we can share um, in the agency. And ultimately, we're going to be putting these all up on GitHub, just in case it's useful to other groups. Um, but so right now, this is a custom one that was uh, of interest to one of our partners, where they wanted to be able to make sure that we are indexing the dimension labels, which is something our search engines at this point have had trouble doing. Um, you know, we have basic faceting. This is all metadata driven. And again, this user interface is, is written by data scientists, not UI designers, but it's to kind of help get feedback from some of our partners on how the search itself is operating, not its usability. Um, you can drill into it. I just want to say, because again, we, we can draw on the triple store and all the metadata that's there. So as searches are happening, it lets them kind of drill in and find the data products they might be interested. And then ultimately, the, this is more like a registry that they would click out of and maybe go to the dot .stat tools to get the kind of rich experience that um, that platform gives them or some of our DDI endpoints. Um, we've also been doing a lot of documentation as part of this is one other lesson learned that uh, when we're doing an integration product like this, we're realizing that uh, a lot of the job of the experiment is to document for our partners kind of what's being done to share mappings with people best practices and, and get some of that kind of technical documentation that's needed to keep the workflow going. And then this is kind of where it's leading to so now we actually are building on top of our experiment, you know, a much richer user experience that will have, you know, a three column layout so that we can display some of the kind of knowledge graph pieces on the right hand side to help, you know, let people kind of walk through the metadata products that we have, as well as the main search and facets and so on. And so this is uh, being developed by some of the IT teams that will then build on top of this platform we've made. Similarly, we're trying to make sure that we have uh, APIs available to other um, partners within the agency in case they want to make custom search fields, custom integrate it with their portals so that we can have sort of one search and discovery platform powered by this metadata that can be uh, reused across the agency easily. Um, where we're going with this, so one of the main pieces that has sort of been mentioned, and we Heard a little bit about in DDI, this kind of XCOS, 
or SCOS. So when we start having some of these uh, statistical classifications, uh, we've built a prototype that can read that information from our ARIA platform. Because SCOS is an RDF um, uh, triple encoding, we can load that into our triple store. If we have the linkages that have been given to us by the metadata experts, like was talked about, then we're using those to generate sort of just-in-time synonym files. So one of them is we have a lot of classifications on national occupations, and we wanted to be able to have synonyms that come from some of those uh, SCOS coding. So we, you know, people could write in, you know, different forms of people that might be in like correctional services and have, you know, many different versions of that. So this is a way we're trying to harness this rich metadata to help in some of the kind of more expensive parts of search optimization, like generating uh, usable synonyms for users. Um, we also have an ongoing project on trying to see if we can uh, change some of the search um, scaling or, or like scoring to take advantage of how deep it is in the metadata piece, that if we're looking at tagged information that's deep in the tree, uh, that you know, if that's lower or higher, uh, what do users feel about uh, finding the information that they like? So just trying to take advantage of how structurally rich a lot of this metadata is before just flattening it into the index. And finally, um, we have some new working prototypes uh, based on trying to take advantage of the geospatial metadata that comes along with this so that we can start having search by region and, and some of that geographic kind of pieces to help people get to the information that they need. And that's, I'm all done. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Uh, it's amazing the all the work that happens behind the scene before um, before arriving at, uh, at an interface that is user-friendly. So the users don't see that, all that work. So mm -hmm. it's really amazing. I'm proud to be part of the same government as you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd like to bring to your attention um, a related session. It's uh, session number nine, nine sorry, uh, on cross-domain inter interoperability framework uh, that's going to take place tomorrow, October 4th at 5.15 p.m. UTC. Uh, in the meantime, uh, please come back at 9.45 uh, UTC for our next sessions. Other se session five, it's the panel on metadata for visual media arts, manga, comics, games, animation, or session six, the panel on metadata that sustains local archives for the global community. Enjoy your break and thank you again to everybody. Bye. Thank, so thank you, Marie. Thanks so Paul. much. David, great to see you. Yeah, cheers, Dan. See you soon. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.